I got suggestions for ways Arthur Smith can improve the offense, but he needs Desmond Ritter to be able to operate the basics first. We're breaking down the film from week four to see where Ritter went wrong on today's Locked on Falcons. You are Locked on Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another illustrious episode of the Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. And if you don't know me, I'm your very humble hope, podcast, very humble podcast host, Aaron Freeman. You may also know me as Sirius Black, as Mr. Holier Than Thou, as well as Mr. Drew. My friends call me Negative Nancy, but you can call me Mr. Drew. You can become one of my friends by becoming an everydayer of this podcast. And all you have to do is make this your first listen each and every day. All you got to do is subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. So today we are reviewing the all 22 from the Falcons week four loss to the Jacksonville Jaguars. We'll talk about the opening script and Ritter's struggles. That will be our primary focus on today. We'll talk about ways I think the Falcons can improve their offense by getting back to basics. We'll talk about some of the changes to the dime defense, some of their play action woes and, and answer maybe a couple of guys listener questions. So let's start things off talking about that opening game script. We talked extensively last week about their opening game script against the Lions and why I didn't have problems with it. Once again, I didn't really have any issues with Arthur Smith's game plan and play calling early in the going because I, I feel like a lot of it was designed to try to get Ritter into a rhythm and Ritter just really um, let Arthur Smith down. Uh, we'll skip the opening series. Uh, nothing too in-depth there. They ran the ball on their first two plays. They didn't really execute on those plays. And then on third down, Bijan made an incredible move on a check down uh, and almost converted. But, you know, it was just execution that led to that three and out. But the real analysis starts on the second series. And you get that first play call, which is a pass play again, trying to get Ritter into a rhythm. They run Scotty Miller in motion. He runs into the flat. Uh, and they also run a, a quick hitch up the scene to Drake London. So you got this sort of high-low concept. It's an easy button. Should be for Desmond Ritter. Pull the trigger to either one of these receivers. Both of them are open. He hesitates, does not pull the trigger, then proceeds to try to step up and scramble in the pocket. He is sacked for no gain. Now you're in second and long. You run a simple screen to Bijan to try to get into a third and more manageable. You get four yards out of it. Then you get even more manageable because Kalevon Chason uh, gives you five yards on an offsides penalty. So now you're in third and one. So you run a stack concept with Bijan in London to your right. Bijan runs a quick out. It's open. Ritter again hesitates to pull the trigger, holds on to the ball. Drew Dahlman gets bull rushed into the quarterback, and then Josh Allen gets that cleanup sack. And I know some of you guys were mad because why are we throwing the ball instead of running the ball on third and one? A large part of that is the Falcons have not been very effective in short yardage, especially on third downs. I know they did convert those two fourth and ones against the Packers, but really outside of that, they haven't really done an effective job. Um, running the football to get one or two yards uh, this season. So I don't fault Arthur Smith for uh, calling a pass play, especially when it comes open like that. So you basically have your second series botched, in my opinion, because the quarterback doesn't pull the trigger on what should be easy throws and reads, right? Um, and again, some of you are like, we should be running the football, but the short, quick passing game is basically like running the football. You know, essentially it's the idea of like, it doesn't really matter how you get four or five yards. If you get four or five yards, you know, running or throwing doesn't really make much of a difference. And you kind of kill two birds with one stone by calling the short passing game. Cause you're also, you know, basically it's like running the football, but also you're getting your quarterback into a rhythm. And this is where the frustration sets in about Desmond Ritter, because now after this, second series, it does feel like he's regressing because he's not making the decisive quick decisions that he was making at the end of last year, right? Now you get to the third series at the start of the second quarter. You start out running the football. Bijan gives you four yards. Then you call a pass on second and six, right? Trying to get again into that rhythm. Uh, you run Mac Hollins into motion into the flat. 
again, stack uh, with Kyle Pitts running a slant. Uh, both technically come open. You know, it looks like Ritter wants to go to Pitts in this situation with the off defender, but he's that off defender may potentially break on it, break up the pass or uh, deliver a hit to Kyle Pitts uh, at the catch point. Um, and so I can understand Ritter being a little bit hesitant to pull the trigger on that sort of small window of throw. But if you're not going to pull the trigger on that, then you have to quickly get that ball out to Mac Hollins right after that. Ritter doesn't do that. Instead, he decides I'm going to go back to the right because all of this is happening to Ritter's left. I'm going to go back to the right and throw it late across the middle to Drake London. And it gets he's fortunate. It only gets broken up uh, in, in, instead of being picked off. That's a very questionable decision, in my opinion. Then you get to third down. You dial up a smash concept, right, where John o. Smith runs a curl route. Kyle Pitts pulls away the coverage with a vertical route uh, and ball comes out with time on 15 yard completion to John o. Smith. I believe pressure was in his face. Shout out to Matt Bergeron on, on, you know, giving up that pressure on that play. And we talked about this smash concept on this play. We talked about the dagger concept, very similar concepts, high lows to Matt Collins in the fourth quarter on a third and 14 last week. And so it does seem like Ritter has no problem running these specific types of concepts, even when pressure's in his face. And, but it's it's fascinating to me, like these more complex, I guess you could say, high low concepts. He has no problem ripping, but some of the other ones, the three that you already called earlier in this game, like he's hesitating on those plays. So after you hit the John U. Smith play, you get back to the run, right? Bijan gets one yard because of questionable blocking up front from the offensive line. But, you know, credit to Chris Lindstrom, you got your pancake on that play. Uh, love it with maple syrup or strawberry syrup. Um, now you're in second and nine. You run a basically what is an, a Yankee concept, a slight variation of a Yankee concept because Drake London's running a vertical, but it's more of a corner route and Kyle Pitts is running a crosser. Uh, and Ritter dials up the deep shot to Drake London. I'm not going to say it's a bad decision, but I don't think it's a good decision on this. Generally, I, I don't have a problem with my quarterbacks being aggressive and taking shots, but if you're reading the leverage on the field pre-snap, you have Kyle Pitts lined up to your left right? With the cornerback having outside leverage, right? And so Kyle Pitts running an in-breaking route has the leverage advantage there with the corner on outside leverage. You have Drake London on the right, right? With the cornerback running outside leverage, but he's running that corner, which is an outbreaking route. And so the corner's in the position there. And it goes back to something that Matt Waldman of the Rookie Scouting Portfolio said on this podcast back in May and June, where Desmond Ritter struggles to read leverage and that, to me, that play, him throwing that to Drake London instead of Kyle Pitts, who's open, uh, not wide open, but open on that play, is a perfect example of Ritter struggling to read that leverage. So now you're on 39. The Jaguars bring pressure. I don't blame Ritter on the breakdown and protection. Again, I don't know who's responsible for that. It looks like to me that Bijan just blows the block, right? Uh, he gets fooled. Uh, so I don't know if the breakdown and protection is on Ritter, but you do want your quarterback to recognize the pressure that's coming and get rid of the ball rather than taking the sack like he did and losing 14 yards. You know, there's a potential hot read check down to Mac Hollins in the flat. Um, so again, I won't blame Ritter on the play breaking down, but I do feel like that shouldn't be a sack. That should be an incompletion at worst. You know, the, the blame goes, I think, to Bijan blowing the protection on this play. And that's been an issue for Bijan through the first month of the season. You know, we know that rookie running backs typically struggle making that transition to the pros when it comes to pass protection issues. You know, so it is somewhat expected that Bijan is a work in progress there, but I think he's consistently blown a lot of these blocks. So this is the only real knock and negative I can say about Bijan's, you know, first four games of the season in terms of like he's not bringing it in terms of pass protection, but in all other ways he is. Now, let's get to the next series. Ritter is better. Start this next series, right? Uh, first pass is check down to Bijan. That's where Bijan makes, you know, redeems himself with a one handed grab, converts a third and eight. Then the next time you run uh, a play action rollout, he hits Jonu Smith on time. Jonu makes, uh, you know, a defender miss in space, gets seven yards on that play. Again, checking the ball down is not a bad thing, especially when you're checking it down to players that can win after the catch like Bijan and Jonu Smith. Then his next pass is a 10 yard throw to Kadero Hodge on another high low concept. He rips it again with pressure in his face. Maybe this is the one where Bergeron gets beat. One of them Bergeron got beat, uh, but, now it looks like Ritter's in a rhythm, and it's like, okay, he now he's executing the offense like we're calling it up, and then the very next pass is that pick six. And as they explained on the broadcast, you know, he misreads the leverage again, 
right? Instead of throwing the flat to Mac Hollins with the defender scraping over the top of Drake London, which with the defender doing that, that slows down Drake London because if Drake London's running full speed, he's going to get OPI on that play, right? So he slows down a little bit and that prevents Drake London from being in position when Ritter throws the ball on the inbreaker. And so with that, he needs to read that defender and throw the ball to Mac Hollins in that situation rather than predetermining his throw by ripping it to Drake London on that particular play. And then of course, on the subsequent drive, the very next pass he throws, he stares down another Yankee concept again, you know, now he's making the right decision seemingly is it, again it's the wrong decision he's predetermining his throw he's staring it down throwing it to Kyle Pitts on that crosser but you know you can't do that my guy throw the check down in the flat so to Ritter's credit I will say that I think on the ensuing series where they ran more two-minute offense and were running more tempo no huddle stuff he did a better job operating the throw to the Mac Hollins was a bad throw although I don't think Mac Hollins was open on that play I know that's a controversial opinion but don't run vertical stuff with Mac Hollins because you know when he's even, he ain't leaving. But I think on the subsequent drives in the third quarter, Ritter was much more operationally successful. So after, you know, that second interception, the operation got much better for Desmond Ritter. And this goes back to a comment that Will McFadden made on yesterday's episode where he wants Ritter to be more of a gunslinger. And I'm, I vehemently disagree with Will on that, especially after watching the film. You need to be a game manager. Arthur Smith is dialing up easy buttons for you. Uh, and you're not taking advantage of those op, uh, those situations. And we need to get back to basics and, and operate the offense as it is called. And so that's one of the reasons why, guys, I am not as down on Arthur Smith's play calling as many of you guys are out there. Again, later in the episode, we'll talk about some adjustments, um, adjustments and changes that I do think Arthur Smith uh, should be making to his offense at this point in time in order to, you know, jumpstart this offense in this passing game. Uh, and, and some of that may include, um, you know, more no huddle, more tempo stuff that they were running uh, in that two minute drill at the end of the half. But, you know, let's be clear about this, right? Ritter was bad in this game. I don't think this is a systemic, right? This has been a consistent issue with Ritter when you look back at his previous seven starts, right? He wasn't really doing this last year, right? Like he made a couple of poor decisions in that first start against the Saints, but the next three games, he was consistently getting to the right answer as the play was being called. And in the first three games, there were a couple of hiccups. We talked about a couple of those where he was turning down checkdowns after that week one game, but I don't think this the issues that he was showing in this specific game against the Jaguars has been consistent. There's been sporadic, certainly don't get me wrong. Um, but as consistently a through line in the first three weeks. So I want to believe that Ritter just had a really bad day in London. Like maybe it was jet lag. Maybe he had some bad fish and chips, something that led to this sort of perfect storm of just Ritter being awful. Uh, like he was in the first half of this game, but I'd like to believe this is a one-off, but you know, when you're going to start hearing me start making the, hey, maybe we need to start making a push for Taylor Heineke is if these types of issues that we're talking about in this Lions game continue to plague this offense, that the reason why the, the Falcons, like the reason why the Falcons got off to a slow start is not Arthur Smith's play calling on against the Jaguars. It was Desmond Ritter. Um, and while he's a young quarterback, I'm not expecting him to be perfect. Basically, he he can't have another game like this again. Right. Because you're you're costing us the game with how he was playing in the first half of this game. But we'll leave that aside. We'll talk about some of the ways where I do think Arthur Smith can improve the offense, getting back to the basics of the run game, as well as adjusting some of his personnel groupings away from the tight end position and utilizing wide receivers and fullbacks a, a lot more. And we'll get into that as we continue today's Locked on Falcons. So our partners over at eBay Motors have teamed up with Locked On Fantasy Football host Vinny Iyer to bring you some of the best fantasy picks each week all season long. And whether you're prepping for your daily drafts or scouting the waiver wire, every week we're going to provide you with players that are guaranteed to fit your roster. So let's see who Vinny has picked for out for us in this week's eBay's Guaranteed Fit fantasy picks of the week. And I like this pick with Packers running back Aaron Jones. He didn't fare well in limited work last week, uh, returning from his hamstring injury. But now that he has a little bit more time off after the mini buy, I think Jones is going to be ready to show his old explosive self as a runner and receiver on Monday night in Las Vegas. And he will feel right at home with plenty of cheese heads, 
making the trip to the desert against the bad Raiders overall defense. And it's not too far down the road where Jones's star was originally born in his hometown of El Paso, Texas. And I love this pick from Vinny. I'm always in favor of finding the guy that's going to face the Raiders and plugging him into my fantasy lineups. And now that Vinny Iyer from Lockdown Fantasy Football has helped us win our fantasy championships, eBay Motors knows a championship team is about each player being a perfect fit. Same is true with your vehicle with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die you can make sure your ride stays running smoothly air filters brakes batteries taillights alternators shock struts whatever your baby needs ebay motors has it and with ebay guarantee fit it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time every time or your money back plus at these prices you're burning rubber not cash baby so you'll never be limited with ebay motors with ebay guaranteed fit everything your vehicle is calling for is just a click away keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com ebay guarantee fit only available to u.s customers eligible items only exclusions apply so before we get into further suggestions about the ways the falcons could improve their offense want to give a plug to the subtext who will get the exclusive extended all 22 review and um, they'll have access to, you know, high definition film of all the plays that I just went through uh, in that first segment, as well as subsequent plays that we'll be talking about later in the episode. And I know usually I post clips of the plays that I talk about on, on these all 22 reviews on Twitter. I, I don't plan on this being a permanent thing long term, but at least this week, I'm not going to do that. So that will be reserved exclusively to the subtext subscribers and so that's just another reason for you to subscribe at least this week you know you get a 14 day free trial so you can try it out for a week if you want to get access to that all 22 review uh that extended one and then after that you get uh 4.99 a month uh is what it costs but you not only are you getting access to the all 22 you get that one-on-one -on -one interaction with me you get little nuggets that i probably won't get to talk about on film that i saw in the film uh, on today's episode, as well as you can ask your questions, whether those be Falcons or non-Falcons related, if you so dire, desire. So check it out, the link in the description below. But let's talk about suggested ways where I think the Falcons can help improve their offense moving forward. And let's be clear, if I had the answers, guys, I probably wouldn't be selling you on a podcast. I'd be getting paid a lot more money. Uh, shout out to Locked On, they pay me well, but not <laughs> not as much as I probably could be making if I had all these answers. So these are merely suggestions, don't have the answers, but just some thoughts I have on it. And we already sort of mentioned the up-tempo, uh, no huddle stuff. Although I do wonder, do you want to lean too much into that, especially if you don't trust Ridger to make the right decisions? So that is something that we'll just sort of have to see. But I really do think overall, the goal should be, let's get back to basics. Let's run the football, right? And like, I don't have a problem with Arthur Smith not calling runs the last couple of weeks to start games, but I do think moving forward, especially coming off of this this Jaguars game where Ritter was making a lot of mistakes, you got to take the ball out of my guy's hand at this point until you can trust him to operate the basics of the offense. And it's funny to me because I was saying a very similar thing back in 2017 on the podcast when the Falcons got off to that 3-0 start and then went on a sort of a month long skid, right? And it's also funny to me because like my opinion on Arthur Smith as a play call is very similar to my opinion of Steve Sarkeesian as a play call. Like they're on a similar level for me. And a lot of my issues with Sark, like they are with Arthur Smith are more philosophical issues than like specifically bad play calls. And for Sark, that a lot of that was because like he was calling, he had the same playbook as Kyle Shanahan, but he didn't have the, the intention of calling plays. You know, I, I call X to set up Y in order to do Z like Shanahan always did. And then Sark eventually was able to get it going in 2018, I think in large part because he had Matt Ryan, Julio Jones, and Calvin Ridley. Uh, you know, and it's hard to fail with those guys in your offense unless your, your name is Dirk Cutter. But, you know, I think there is some intention in Arthur Smith's offense. I don't think there's a lot of intention when it comes to the explosive plays in his offense. Uh, but I do think the majority of the intention that I do see on Arthur Smith's offense is related to the run game and the play action passing off of that run game. We'll talk more about the play action a little bit later in the episode. But, you know, back in 2017, I was like, we got to get back to basics. We got to run the football. We got to put the fullback back on the field. You know, not Patrick DeMarco. That was uh, Derek 
Coleman, I think it was. And I feel like Arthur Smith should kind of do the same thing. And so this is my tried and true answer. Get back to basics. Let's run the football. Let's be a fullback driven offense. Bijan has been very effective running behind Keith Smith this year. Credit to Keith Smith. He heard all the slander from me on this podcast because I didn't think he played particularly well last year. He was fine, but not particularly great. And he's been balling uh, through the first four games this year. I think the Falcons got to scrap their 13 personnel, their three tight end sets. I was joking on the discord, um, you know, using the office space, uh, the two bobs, like what, what exactly do you do here when it, referring to John Fitzpatrick and Michael Pruitt? Cause they're not doing anything. And I know you're saying, Aaron, you just love Parker Hesse. You have a bias. And like, I do have a bias. You're right. Because I saw Parker Hesse doing the exact same job that they're asking Michael Pruitt to do. And Parker Hesse did that job. Well, and Michael Pruitt is mm, just a guy. So I do have a bias there, but I do think more 11 personnel, more three wide receiver sets would help. You know, Kadero Hodge has been very effective in limited action as a pass catcher. Uh, he's also been a very good blocker, better than Mac Hollins, right? I think Scotty Miller has not had many opportunities this year, but I think we should be seeing more of him running those vertical routes that they're giving to Drake London and, and, and Mac Hollins and you know, have the guy that runs a four two something, right? You know, this has been a pattern with Arthur Smith, where right? You know, go back to 2021 where his misuse of Calvin Ridley and, and not using Marvin Hall at all. And now it's Scotty Miller. And it's like, this man is truly allergic to speed, but that's a rant for another day. So I think, you know, this is a philosophical issue. Arthur Smith is never a big fan of three wide receiver sets, but I think he needs to incorporate more of it in his offense. He did a little bit more this week against uh, Jacksonville than he did in previous weeks. But the reason why I think it helps, especially in the run game is because when you play 11 personnel, three wide receivers, defenses play nickel against you. And what that does is it lightens the box and the analytics and data tell us that the lighter the box is, the less defenders in the box, typically six in nickel um, versus seven in base or eight when you can stack that box, um, the better your rushing success is, right? That the number one determining factor of a, whether a run is successful is how many defenders are in the box more so than your offensive line or your running back quality. Now, according to next gen stats, you know, Algier is running versus eight man boxes about 38% of the time and Bijan about 30% of the time. You compare that to Algier last year, it was 40% for him and 37% for CP. So not a drastic difference in terms of the Falcons run game running into heavy boxes. So, but I do think this will help jumpstart the run game because the Falcons run game has been very good, but not as good as it was a year ago. Right now, their overall rushing success rate when they hand the ball off to a running back is 49% this year. And last year, overall, it was 56%. But through the first four games, that was 64%. And that works out to be, on average, about three and a half more successful runs through the first four games last year than they have currently this year. So again, not a drastic difference in improved quality, but every little thing at this point, I think, you know, if you can get three more positive plays three or four more positive plays running the football uh especially early in games i think that can help benefit this offense so you know the falcons are only running about 11 personnel on about 12 percent of their snaps that's down from 28 percent last year that was 31st in the league now they're dead last the ravens last year were dead last with seven percent Going into the Jaguars game, the Falcons were running 11 personnel, 9%. So they were very similar to the Greg Roman Ravens. And that made sense to a certain extent, given the Ravens wide receivers stunk last year. And they had Mark Andrews and, and Isaiah Likely with their two of their better pass catches. And in theory, Kyle Pitts and Johnny Smith could be very similar. But we know Pitts is not putting up production comparable to Mark Andrews. So clearly, Arthur Smith is calling an offense where he thinks that the Falcons have the worst wide receiver court in the league. Uh, and I don't. You know, I don't think the Falcons have a good wide receiver core. Clearly, you heard me all off season long saying, let's go out there and add Corey Davis and Hunter Renfro. But I do think it's more capable than what it has shown so far. And, you know, given some concerns that Arthur, uh, that I'm sorry, that Kyle Pitts is not 100% recovered from that knee issue. And it did look like in this Jaguars game in London uh, that it was that knee was bothering him a lot more than it did the previous week. Um, you know, I don't think it would be a negative thing to ease his workload, maybe get John o. Smith more involved. He was very effective against the Jaguars last week as that solitary tight end in those 11 personnel. But, you know, I know the Falcons are never going to be a quote unquote normal NFL team and run three wide receiver sets 50, 60 percent of the time. But I feel like it's got to be a lot higher than 12 percent. That should be 30 percent or more. So to summarize, I think the suggestions are let's run the football until we can figure out what's going on with Desmond Ritter. Let's lean on Keith Smith because he's balling. Let's get Michael Pruitt out of here. Right. You know, instead of playing 25 snaps a game like he has been over the first month, he should be playing eight tops at this point. And let's get 
Scotty Miller and Kadero Hodge more involved in this offense. And again, I think if you're running these high-low contests that seem to work with better with Desmond Ritter, at least some of the time, you know, having receivers that can actually separate on those plays uh, may make a little bit of sense. But, you know, call me crazy with that idea. So we'll talk a little bit more about what's going on with the play action passing. But first, we'll talk about the defense and some of the changes that were made to the dime defense without Troy Anderson in the lineup. We'll get into that to wrap up today's Locked on Falcons. So today's episode is sponsored by BetterHelp, and sometimes you find yourself lying awake at night with racing thoughts, and a great way to make those thoughts go away is to talk through them, and therapy gives you a place to do that. You've heard me talk about how therapy has benefited me over the past year, and that's thanks to BetterHelp. Therapy has helped me understand that I can only control what I can control, and I don't control if the Falcons draft a good player or win a football game. The thing I can control is the quality of this podcast, and the feedback I've gotten from you guys over the past year is that the podcast quality has improved. And again, that's thanks to BetterHelp. And if you're thinking of starting therapy, I cannot recommend BetterHelp enough to give them a try. It's entirely done online. It's more affordable than traditional offline therapy, which certainly was what kicked me in the pants to go uh, and designed. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, suited to your schedule. All you got to do is fill out a brief questionnaire and you'll get matched with a licensed therapist and sw- you can switch therapies at any time for no additional charge. So let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash locked on. So let's talk about the dime changes, right? Uh, where last week we talked about the Falcons deploying their Ruby defense, their Ruby dime defense extensively. Last week, you know, dime being six defensive backs, but the Ruby variation having two linebackers, Troy Anderson and Caden Ellis, over the more traditional one linebacker dime defense. And the question was, would that change with Anderson going down for the year, at least for this week? The answer was yes. The Falcons played much more uh, traditional dime with four uh, down linemen, one linebacker and six DBs with taking Nate Lamon off the field and leaving Kay Nellis out there. Uh, and it makes sense. Lamon's a very good run defender, but I think his limitations and coverage were exposed a little bit more against the Jaguars, uh, you know, due to the lack of speed, the Jaguars weren't able to exploit it to a huge degree, but a little bit more than Lamon in the previous matchup against the Packers. Um, and, you know, we'll see if other teams are successful. They got a couple of good tight ends uh, the rest of the way. TJ Hawkinson later in the year. Uh, this week, Dalton Schultz with the Texans. And I'll be curious, given that the Texans offensive coordinator, Bob Slowick, comes from the Shanahan tree. And, you know, that tree is notorious for, you know, finding and exploiting the weak link in the defense. And I could see them spamming Dalton Schultz to a degree if he gets matched up with Nate Landman a bunch. The other change to their dime defense was we saw a lot more DeMarco Hellams, exclusively DeMarco Hellams as the sixth defensive back instead of Jalen Hawkins. Why did they make that switch? I'm guessing it's because they just want to give their rookies more run early in the season like they did last year. So that in the event of injuries down the road, those guys aren't necessarily, you know, jumping into the deep end right off the bat. So, you know, I didn't love the fact that they were asking Hart Helms to do this because I don't think Helms is a good deep safety. And that's primarily what he was asked to do in the dime. Uh, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. So, you know, we'll, uh, answer a question via subtext. It comes from Eddie. He says, Hey, Aaron, I know that you said the play calling hasn't been bad. I just get the feeling that Arthur Smith is calling plays as if the offensive line is as good as we expected it to be coming into the season. I'm wondering if the team might be more successful with more max protect and runs like he was calling for Mariota at the beginning of last year. Am I off base here? Just wondering if more can be done to mask the weaknesses in pass protection and give Ritter more time to process, which he clearly needs at this point. Also, I'm not really a film guy. It's entirely possible that Smith is already doing this and I'm just not picking up on. So yes, Eddie, I do think Smith is already doing this. He's They're running a lot of max protect. I don't think it's to the same degree that they were with Mariota, which was an egregious degree, <laughs> if you ask me, uh, but they are using it at a high rate, right? It's a lot of those two-man and three-man route concepts. Uh, Ritter's second interception in this game uh, to Cisco was one where they had max protect. Uh, and a lot of that is the, their play-action passing game. But the problem is their play-action passing game is not very effective under Desmond Ritter. It has not been in the eight games that he's played. You compare it to the eight games with Mariota, right? Mariota was basically like a top-10 quarterback in play-action last year. And that's one of the reasons why the Falcons used a use more play action percentage wise uh, than any other team in the league last year, uh, at least in the regular season. And then you looked at the last four games, they were still third in the league in terms of uh, percentage of usage, but Ritter graded out um, as the 40th best quarterback uh, 
using play action according to PFF. And it was easy to kind of dismiss that as, oh, well, he doesn't have Kyle Pitts. Uh, and once he gets more weapons, he'll be fine. But Ritter continues to be at the bottom of the league in, in, in terms of his effectiveness with play action. He's 35th out of 36 quarterbacks this year. The Falcons are seventh in uh, usage so far this year. So it's going to be really hard for this offense to work if Desmond Ritter in the play action passing game can't develop uh, over the rest of the season because the the core identity of this offense is a run first play action heavy offense and the running game is good but not elite and dominant like it was a year ago and if 50 percent of that identity is the play action passing game and it isn't working it's going to be real tough sledding for this offense so that is going to do it for us guys on today's all 22 review um appreciate all the questions we'll be back tomorrow with a uh crossover thursday to preview this week five matchup with locked on tights